Hey everybody, welcome back to Anderson's TV and today my special guest is Tracy Guns from, I mean, what band hasn't he been in, but LA Guns, I obviously. Band. I, band. Uh, I started Led Zeppelin <laughs> in 1968, right when I was done with the Yardbirds and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, yeah, I've been in every band. In every band ever and it's his <laughs> birthday today, at least it's his birthday on the day we're filming, so uh, very, very uh, happy birthday, special returns uh, from everyone at Anderson's. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 20, thank you. 21 again. Well, I'm 55 and proud. <laughs> Good for you, man. Good for you. Well, it's fast approaching us all, that's for sure. Um, yes, before you know it, trust me. Yeah. So look, we're here today because uh, we're going to talk a little bit um, about your new signature guitar with Kramer, which is so cool. It's like it's it's one of the hottest sort of, you know, reborn brands at the moment. Um, but I have to start this interview with just sort of going, you know, your your Wikipedia page is just, it's like the who's who of everything that was cool <laughs> when that kind of LA rock scene kicked off. Um, yeah, I'd really like to thank whoever put that page together. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost accurate and, and I'll take it off. Almost accurate. Well, that's, yeah, I love Wikipedia. So come on, tell me, you know, you, you, I'm six or seven years younger than you are, but so, you know, kind of when you were, starting to make it that was when i was starting to get into it kind of thing so right. um you know for me just you know growing up on bon jovi and aerosmith and you know all motley crew guns it's like i you know what a scene that must have been to be a part of so can you can you tell us you know a little bit about do you remember any of it for a start <laughs> <laughs> i do i do i i was uh very much an observer the whole time you know i mean i never you know got involved in the the darker side of the needle and the, you know things like that so yeah i mean it was you know whatever people imagine it was definitely that and then add reality to it you know <laughs> so there was wine women and song and you know a lot of good music a lot of crap music a lot of <laughs> a lot of you know, guys that look like women and women that look like guys and uh, a lot of cocaine that I witnessed. I, like I said, I never really, really got involved with it because I, I, you know, I had friends that died really young, you know, so I was like, ooh, you know, uh, you know, I think I'll go home and practice and get good at this instead of just, you know, pouting my lips all the time and photograph. You know? <laughs> so, uh, but it, it was, it was really, um, what I would really consider the last of a fun, healthy Los Angeles music scene, because, you know, there's so many documentaries about the, the 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, and they had really big times on the Sunset Strip, you know, and a lot of it was politically involved, you know, like, you know, the scene, you know, in the late 60s, early 70s, you know, there was so much going on with you know the vietnam war and things like that and it really reflected in the music that was on you know the sunset strip you know which the sunset strip kind of encompasses a large area of not just that street you know what i mean so um you know right before us or really right before kind of you know the mid 70s you know you have linda ronstadt and the eagles and and you know all this stuff and then you know we were kind of like, you know, I'm going to bring up Slash in this because, you know, we went to, you know, basically elementary school and junior high school and high school together. And our, our parents were very pseudo hippie rock and roller kind of people, you know. Um, so we kind of grew up with a sense that the only thing that we were going to do was be involved in music somehow, you know what I mean? I mean, there was nothing cooler, you know? I mean, if you were if you were somewhat of like, you know, a, a studious kid at the time, you know, it wasn't encouraged by your parents. It's like, no, man, you know, you grow your hair out, you know, play a ukulele, anything, and, you know, and then you'll be accepted by, you know, your family kind of thing. You know, my uncle Ron, he's the one that really started showing me how to play guitar when I was six years old. You know, he had hair past his ass and, and, and he went on to become a, a mechanical engineer, you know, at the same company for 30 years. Um, and I grew up right next to the Hollywood sign 
and uh, I went to Fairfax High School, which Fairfax was actually, it's always kind of described as like the snootier version of Hollywood High School. You know, Hollywood High School kind of sprung like the Beach Boys and Love and of course a lot of other things, but Fairfax High School was kind of, you know, we're really fucking cool, you know, kind of, kind of, kind of thing. And if you didn't go to Fairfax, you were a poser, you know. And uh, so, you know, I kind of struggled at Fairfax. Like, well, you know, I'm not a poser, but I, I don't want to be like that. I just want to play, and I want to be Randy Rhodes and Jimmy Page. You know, that was always, you know, I still want to be Randy Rhodes and Jimmy Page. That's <laughs> one thing that's never changed. But, um, but you know, starting really in high school. Speaking of Motley Crue, you know, we could go and, you know, I saw Motley Crue at their first gig in Hollywood and it changed my life. You know, I was like, like whoa, what, the, what, what is that? You know, because everybody's by now, you know, so I don't know what desensitized to these sorts of, you know, loud heavy metal bands with, you know, leather and like But at the time, when Motley Crue came out, there was Wasp. There was Wasp and Motley Crue. And it kind of came out of the L.A. punk rock scene at that time. Because, you know, punk rock really kind of survived until about 80, 81 in L.A. And we were really into it. You know, I mean, we had we had the germs. You know what I mean? So, like, yes, you know, we're, we're punk rock. And we all dressed apart. So in about a year's time, I went from having spiky black hair to having Johnny Thunder's long black hair because of Nikki Six. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, when Wasp and Motley Crue started playing the Troubadour and the Whiskey, everything changed, you know, and, and there were other bands, you know, Rat was around then and stuff like that. And, and so it was healthy, you know, we yeah. go and, but it wasn't quite as fun yet, you know, as soon as... <laughs> You know, you had bands like like Poison and stuff like that, which was, you know, just before L.A. Guns and Guns N' Roses and that stuff. It started getting really fun because now you had, we always had a really cool alternative scene in L.A., like James Addiction at the time, and Red Hot Chili Peppers and stuff like that. And But we all grew up together, you know, so, you know, Slash and I wanted to be in bands that were like Led Zeppelin and Aerosmith and Sabbath. And then we had all these other friends that, you know, were really into the cure and, and into stuff like that. And so we all kind of just hung together and had all these weird influences. And by the time I think Motley Crue kind of exited the club scene in LA, you know, we just kind of stepped right in, you know, and, and with some foresight, you know, it was like, it's like, Hey, you know, you know, Motley Crue and Van Halen had such a big impact on the LA scene. You know, how can we not copy those things exactly, but, you know, take the next leap. What's the next leap? And I think the, the conscious and unconscious decision was how can we make it more musical, but still keep it gnarly, you know, mm-hmm. still keep it, you know, without getting, I mean, for lack, I, I hate to say this, but like, how can we not sound like docking, but still be metal in, in, you know, 1983, 1984. And it was easy. Listen to Hanoi rocks and, and New York dolls and, and early Aerosmith. And we all loved that music. So we were able to kind of put wasp and the New York dolls together in Aerosmith. But, you know, I will say we had musicality, you know, we had musicianship, you know, we had, you know, the music was, more important than the image but we were never going to get rid of the image you know what i mean because we knew that especially until like 88 the image was everything it was it was great man you know you could go to the, the rainbow and just stare at people until they close you, you know it, it was wicked man it was so cool i, I mean i think again i kind of you looking back now at what bands like that looked like at the time and it's just it's sort of incredible really that they got away with it really in the sense that it was so outrageous I, I don't even know there's ever been a more kind of outrageous period for everything in terms of you know that the the what the 
the way bands looked and the the the, the extremes that the music was you know some of the guitar virtuosity you know the speed oh, yeah. you know all that everything was like pushed you know to the limit um did, did well, you really, really quick yeah so talk about that image right and like you know, getting away with it i remember i remember one evening before going to see some band i was in there was like a little you know grocery store across the street from the troubadour and there was a bunch of rockers in there and you know at that time i was wearing black leather pants and stiletto heels and you know <laughs> and, and i and i remember thinking to myself this is so normal you know like <laughs> like where else in the world is this normal right now and will this ever end you know i i, I was probably 19 years old and i thought to me will this ever end this is so great and so cool and like I could walk into the bank, you know, with like sort of a G string on and, and a leather jacket and no one, no one would even look at you twice because it was so normal at the time. So, I mean, so to add to the mentality is it wasn't just on stage, you know, like if you saw Vince Neil out walking around man, he had his red leathers on, it didn't matter if it was a hundred degrees out and he was waiting in line for gas. Nobody let their guard down. It was amazing. Oh, I, I, that. Hollywood scene at that time must have been stunning. But as a guitar player, was it? Did was there a sense of community? And because you had so many killer guitar players in, you know, a relatively small uh, patch, uh, and and you know, and guitar players who even now I think people look back on and go, yeah, that they were they were nobody ever really did their thing any better. Um, right. Did you feel a sense of community, or was there a sense of one-upmanship? And almost, you know, a sense of like, geez, I re it's like, what am I going to do? Because such and such is, you know, he's playing like faster than me or playing licks. Like, you know, what, what's the, or, or was it like, was there like a brotherhood community thing going on there? Well, that's, it's an interesting question because, you know, I'm going to omit myself and slash for a second. Like I said, we were a little bit younger than a lot of the bands that we were playing with at the same time. And a lot of the guys, most of the guys, were still kind of Eddie Van Halen clones. You know, they were really trying to one up Eddie mm. or Randy or something like that. And you know, since we walked to school together and had our own <laughs> rivalry, you know, you can imagine the strangest friendship we had. You know, it's like, you know, there was a conversation about, you know, Slash telling me over and over again, you know, from a, I'm never going to play a Les Paul through a Marshall. Everybody uses that. <laughs> and me thinking, well, what else would you play? You know, and, you know, I'd be like Joe Perry, you know, play through a Sun Amp with a PC Rich bitch, you know, like these kind of conversations. So really early on, we had kind of made the bed to where if we weren't original, if we weren't doing our own thing, that, then we were worthless. So for us, like, I can't really think of any competition that Slash would have had in that in those early days. And I can't think of any competition that I really would have had because we weren't very much the same. You know, we, you, you know, we adopted, he adopted this kind of Joe Perry mm. thought process where I was really trying to figure out how to put Randy Rhodes and Johnny Thunders and Jimmy Page together. You know, that was it. You know, I wasn't going to, you know, cut my hair like Eddie Van Halen and, you know, and do that stuff. Not that I, that I don't love playing like that because I'll tell you more than ever now when we tour and I put that guitar on that you're sitting next to, I mean, it's Eddie Van Halen, man. It just comes out. It's like, wow, you know, um, but yes, there was not camaraderie there was camaraderie at the bar, not talking about music, but you'd be hard pressed to find a guitarist in LA from 1978 through 1988, saying good things about a competitor, <laughs> you know, and, but it goes along with the attitude of the music, doesn't yeah. it? Because very macho penis driven rock, you know, who could get the chicks who had the best car, who could play the fastest licks, you know, and um, it's just the way it was. And, but interesting now, um, you know, a lot of the guys have become close. I'm close with a lot of guitar players now, you know, 
um, from all different genres and stuff like that. But I was pretty protective of what I was doing. And, and believe me, so was Slash. You were really just kind of like, hey, I'm working on my shit. And we were doing gigs, you know, twice a month, working on our shit, always just like still working on it, still working on it. Then all of a sudden we got signed and it was like, Ugh! you know, and the only reason any of us got signed then was we were so fucking unique and people came to see us, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, the shows were packed. There was no other way. I mean, there was no, we weren't going to stick it out in LA because it happened so fast. We came on the heels of the Motley Crue craze, you know, and, and it was a craze and, you know, but I wasn't ready. You know, I really, you know, when we did the first record, which is everybody's favorite, I was not ready. <laughs> I was first time I walked in the studio and I had been a studio guy, but when going in to do your own record at 21 years old, I was like, now what? You know, wow. I didn't know what gear was. So that's, that's an interesting point there. So not ready. So you're not saying you weren't ready for the, the fame. You just weren't ready for the, ex, the, the recording experience. Was it, is it for you like it's a very different thing to, to playing live or, or do you try to, were you trying to recreate that kind of live excitement in the studio? Well, there was that balance because, you know, the, the whole idea was that Van Halen recorded their records pretty much live and overdone vocals, you know, same with Motley Crue. And, but for me, you know, I was so into this Jimmy Page way of thinking that, you know, you you get your, your stuff together, you record the bass and drums and whatever, and then you color everything with guitars, you know. So I had that on one side, and then I had this, you know, kind of Randy Rhodes triple tracking thing on the other side, okay, you know, balancing this. But then I was five years younger than the next guy in my own band. And those guys just wanted to be the Rolling Stones. You know, they're, they're like, they're like, hey, it doesn't matter. Plug into an amp. It's like, no, it doesn't, you know, I, I got to have the right, you know, it's got to sound a certain way. And the first record, all I had was, uh, I had my Randall RG80 rack mounted heads <laughs> and I ran in stereo and the, the engineer, we're not recording you in stereo. I'm like, ah, what do you mean? You know, that's my sound. You know, it was, you know, oh, we'll do all those things later. You know, I'm like, so, you know, when I listen to the record, I know it's good, but it's it's a bit rough. <laughs> so who was the producer on that? Because presumably at 21 years old, you're just kind of going, "What am I even allowed to say what I want it to be, or do I just have That's to?" That's right. That's right. It was uh, Jim Faraci who was the who was a uh, like the second engineer on the Rat albums. Right. And then, but the engineer was a guy named Charlie Bracco, and he was really comforting. You know, like he would let me take my time and think about things and, and give suggestions. And that, see, that was the really difficult part for me until, I, you know, maybe I was 35 is that you couldn't give me suggestions. I didn't, I didn't want to hear any suggestions. I was like, like, no, I know what I want to do. And, and it kind of hashed out to, I always had the cave. I always had to listen and I was never happy with, things you know i was never happy with the recordings you know my 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 favorite recordings are from uh let's see i guess 2002 till now and in 2002 we did a record called waking the dead with andy johns and you know he's just like no man go go what have you got give me more you know he was like this this you know, i want to hear your ideas you know whatever's going on in your head do that do that you know you want to max everything out. Let's max everything out. You know, he wasn't this clinical uh, engineer because he really was an engineer in the end. But I learned so much from those sessions with him that I never wanted to work with anybody else again. So it's like, it's either me or Andy because I learned what I needed to know from him. So I could go into any situation and still kind of be a dick, you know, like, like, Hey, I don't want to hear your suggestions, but unfortunately I'm older and kinder now. So if I am in those situations, I'm like, Oh yeah, let's work together. <laughs> oh, I love that idea. Yeah. But that just happens to me. It happens. That's just, life. that's maturity, isn't it? I think. And just, uh, oh, that's, like that. I mean, it's look, I, I'm, I'm interested in, you know, the gear journey. I mean, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm loving that, that kind of, it, it, it it, 
those two stereo Randall kind of things. That's such an 80s kind of vibe, isn't it? And I can yeah. hear it now, a big stereo chorus, all that kind of stuff going on with yeah. the guitar sounds. Almost, it was almost a for, it almost feels like it was a formula in that time to get a guitar sound. Um, and, it, and it is, you can hear that music now and go, yeah, I, I can tell you the decade that that was done in because kind of mm -hmm. that was the formula. But anyway. So tell me about the journey, because, you know, I mean, I know you're a big Les Paul fan. Mm -hmm. um, I see, you know, lots of tube amps in your kind of, you know, set up over the years, lots of Marshalls, right. all that kind of stuff. So uh, I, I what I don't know, though, apart from recently, is where the, where the Kramer connection came in. So is was that mm -hmm. a, you know, obviously, if you go back into the 80s and, you know, Eddie using Kramer and it was mm -hmm. a big deal back then. And I guess, you know, Gibson, a trying to do that Phoenix from the Flames thing with, with the Kramer brand now. But right. did you use Kramer back back in the day? No, I didn't. Right. Uh, I was, okay, so, you know, when we talk about Eddie Van Halen and Randy Rhodes, this was a big influence on my playing. And, of course, Gary Moore, like victims of the future mm -hmm. era, you know, whammy bar kind of stuff. And so since I was... 15 maybe 14 or 15 i always had a les paul and i always had like a strat or a star body or something with a, with a whammy bar and then you know in 1987 you know bc rich came and swooped me up when we did the gunslinger so that was kind of what i did but you know i would always find amazing charvels from the late 70s and stuff and i would kind of sneak them in i was with ibanez for a minute way back then and um, so I was always known for this, but live and in the studio, I always, a couple songs would have to have these types of guitars. And um, so recently I was working with a small company uh, in Orange County called Chub Tone. And they built me, you know, these real 80s Charvel, you know, <laughs> masterpiece guitars. And so those were my other guitars, were my Les Pauls and those. And of course, I have Tellys and Strats and all that shit, but they don't really count as far as Tracy Guns, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. it's like okay. So um, Jared James Nichols comes over and he says, he goes, hey, you know, I, I'm with Gibson. I got, a, I got this Epiphone coming out and they want me to bring you over. <laughs> and I'm like, fuck Gibson, they fucked me over in 92. And he goes, no, they went bankrupt and these new people bought the company and blah, blah. I'm like, what? You know, wow, you know, what rock have I been at? You know? <laughs> so I go, I go to the Hollywood showroom and I meet Beth and, and uh, Todd Harapiak and they're like, we know what happened. You know, we're so sorry and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, how do you know? And they said, well, you're not the only one. You know, like, you know, that, that, Larry, Harry, whatever the guy's name was. Henry. <laughs> Henry. Yeah. You know, he, he screwed a lot of people over, you know. And uh, so anyways, they welcomed me back with open arms. And they gave me a Rick Nielsen, you know, 59 Les Paul that day. I was like, ah, you know, this rules. These guys are so cool now. This is a completely different company. So um, like Insta family. You yeah. Know? Me, me and Jared are there just pulling guitars off the walls. And Todd has the original photograph like print of the back of the cock and loaded our second album yeah. album cover of just the band guys like behind it i'm like okay all right i believe you this is cool so nam shows coming up six months later or something like that and, and uh they just wanted me to go there i'm kind of agoraphobic i don't really do conventions well you know i kind of like hi oh, i see ya <laughs> But, but they needed me to sign some flats and some things for, for Gibson. And I get there and Al John, who heads up Epiphone yep. pretty much, he pulls me aside, he goes, come here. You know, he walks me into this Kramer room. I'm like, what the hell is this? You know, he goes, yeah, we're relaunching Kramer. And I thought like they were relaunching Kramer that day. You know, like they had 200 Kramers on the wall. I'm like, like well, great job. You know, he goes, he goes, no, 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 no. You know, we were talking because I'm already signed up over the long haul to do an Epiphone signature and a Gibson one. And, and he says, he goes, how would you feel about doing a Kramer signature model? And I'm like, 
how, why, you know, like, you know, how do I fit, you know, where, you know, I know how it made sense, but what guitar, you know, like, what am I associated with? What, what Kramer guitar had I been playing yeah. for so many years to where I would have a signature model. So there was a lot of talk, you know, like, like, well, Al John, I would, I want to do this, but we need to come up with a reason, you know, like I have to have a, make a guitar, come up with a concept that totally makes sense, you know, to launch a brand with a guy with a new guitar that has no past association with the brand. So I thought about it. And the one thing that I always wanted is I wanted my, my hot rod guitar, this one, to be a Les Paul with a Floyd Rose and a cool 80 shape. And that's what I did is I was able to take that typical bolt on neck guitar and through a lot of trial and error, we got a set neck like a Les Paul. I see that that's, that's the money right there. It's that neck joint and it didn't work right away. You know, there's not a lot of meat when you add a second pickup in the star body, you know, it, it would have been easier if I would have just had one pickup. But since we added the, the neck pickup, we, we failed the first time trying to do the step neck. And, and I got I got kind of bummed out. I didn't think it was going to happen. And then it got sorted out. And uh, Al John called me and he goes, hey, we, we did it. We nailed it. And I'm like, wow. So they got it out to me. And I changed the strap button position. That's the only thing I've done different. And it's a Les Paul in the shape of a hot rod. You know, with a Floyd, it's it's just I love that guitar. And what what was the so, what was the sort of star shaped inspiration? Which which guitar did you take that from that you, that you played? Uh, when I was younger, I had uh, it was a Wayne Charvel neck through star body, and it was white yeah. with like blue and orange flames on it that was a prototype that Howie Huberman had given me who, who had a guitar shop on sunset called uh, guitars are us. And, <laughs> and, and it was uh, such a special guitar. And I get, I had to give it back to him. He didn't give it to me permanently to keep, you know, he's like, he's like, Hey man, this is a one of a kind. And, and, and you know, those guys, I was really young then, like 13 and those guys had take, taken me out to meet uh, Grover Jackson and stuff, you know, and so, I mean, I was really into this Randy Rhodes right. Concord shape, but the star shape to me was always just like, man, that's, that's awesome. It's so evil. You know, it's so just my, my taste in hot rods. You know is that I mean? where the, is that where the flames come from then this original one that you're talking about? So yeah. you've done this sort of graphite um, gray. I mean, yeah. it, it looks fantastic. I mean, just, just for the guys who are, who are watching, I mean, when I first picked this up, I, mean, I wouldn't necessarily gravitate towards a Floyd Rose kind of guitar, and I'm not a big sort of skinny neck kind of fan, but you yeah. pick this up and it has got that Les Paul feel yeah. up this end. I yeah. really like what they've done with the, the fingerboard edges. It's, it's, it's got a, a sort of a rolled kind of lived in sort of feel. Um, mm. They've used the pro buckers for the for the humbuckers, so it's got yeah. a kind of a fat tone. And like you say, the, the neck join is, I mean, it's almost like, there couldn't be, it's almost like a glove style fit when you're up, you know, round about the sort of 15th, 17th fret. It's kind of very, very comfortable. And then we've got- it has no tone knobs either, which is- Yeah, I, it took me a while to, to sort of go, hang on, what's going on here? So we got, we've got a volume, a volume for each pickup. I know this yeah. is this is the craziest wrong way around. I should just apologize. This is I don't know if this is Brexit or COVID or just general <laughs> disorganization on everyone's part here. But yes, I've got the guitar that Tracy should have at the moment. Uh, but, <laughs> so I'm afraid you get some. You get me, not Tracy. <laughs> but we can roll the tone down and get some clean tone. And it's coil taps as well. So if we want real kind of thin, you know, like yeah. clean. And then just using a, I'm just using a, a dirty channel on an amplifier. Yeah. 
Now, I'm, not, I'm no shredder, so I'm not going to go there, but it's a very, very nice feeling guitar. Well, you, you know, the thing is, is like, to me, what you just played and the way the guitar sounded, even through the speakers, that's that's the sound I want. You yeah. know, and when you know, when, when you think of Pro Bucker, it's, it's, you know, stylistically a low output pickup. So you are able to clean up really nice, even when your amp is growling, you know, and I have to be able to do that because that's what I do with the Les Paul, you know, 50s wiring, you know, if you got to roll it down, it has to stay sparkly. Um, and that you can only really do that with low output pickups. So essentially, if you put on any of my, you know, Gibson, you know, the ones that Gibson have made for me, my Les Pauls, they sound the same, you know, they, they, they act the same. And, and I have, you know, coil splits on those guitars as well. And I don't really think you need anything else. I mean, Joe Bonamassa uses tone knobs, you know, he's the only guy I know besides Jeff Beck that does. Um, I've never touched a tone knob in my life other than to go, why isn't my guitar bright enough? <laughs> you, you know, but that's, but that's my style. You know I mean? That's, that's how, how I play. So, um, you know, that guitar is the guitar I play heavy metal on. You know, that's the, the only way I can describe it is it's like, okay, you know, we have these songs on the set or I'm making an album. Well, that's the guitar I use to do these things and to do, you know, heinous, you know, air raid sirens and, and, and Eddie Van Halen whammy bar and Randy Rhodes and all those things that are such a big part of my playing. It's nice to know that that's the only guitar I'm going to be using for that stuff. Is this you know? when, when people see you playing um, this model, are you using a stock factory model or do you have like a custom shop version or? literally just the model the same model that's hanging up in the guitar stores it's, it's, the same, it's the prototype that's the only one i have i have the prototype and uh it's fucking killer man i'm trying the only the only modification i i made is like i said was moving the strap button um because in that position and anybody that's ever played a star body knows that if you put the strap button in the place where it's the most obvious it's very neck heavy yeah so i actually put it in just right in the neck joint at the very top and it sits just like like a Les Paul. I'm just That's I'm kind of balancing it on one leg and look it doesn't feel like it wants to dive one way or the no. other it's it is actually it's not a bad balanced body is it so and I like no. again the thousand series Floyd Rose is is like that's the minimum for me. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't go lower than that. It's, it's the first one in the Floyd range that, you know, works properly, keeps its tuning. I, I always love this Kramer thing. I always love the way they have the tool set on because you always need like, you know, it's like, where's the Allen key? I don't know. It's like, it's always screwed into the back of the headstock. It's a very, you know. You love it till you lose one of the wrenches on accident. <laughs> <laughs> that's very cool, man. Well, that's exciting. I'm kind of um, interested to see that getting used a little bit more on stage. Um, yeah. Tell us then, you know, how have you, as a musician, how, did, how have you coped with the last 10 or 12 months? Has it, has it enabled you to, to sort of step back and be quite creative or has it been a frustrating time? And, and you know, what, what's the plans for, for 2021 or whatever year we're in now? Yeah, yeah, it really does all run together. I mean, I got, you know, it worked out for me in a crazy, crazy way, you know. Um, we decided to, to set up my family, you know, we decided to come to Denmark and we had our baby last February, you know, so he's almost a year old and it was like all of a sudden COVID hit and I couldn't go, we couldn't go back to LA, you know? So I was like, Hmm, okay. So I started writing the new LA guns record and then we put out a single like, I guess in like April this last year and had really great success. And then I finished up an album I was working with Michael Sweet on called Sunbomb, which is coming out this April now. So I was able to get those things finished while still raising a child, a little child with my wife. And then I have a 12 year old son in LA who managed to go back there a few times and, and spend time with him and all of us go back and forth. So I can't say that I've been idle, you know, and I started giving lessons to make some bucks about six months ago on Zoom. So 
Yeah, you know, but I'll, I'll tell you, the, the sad thing about it for me is like, I'm not looking forward to doing long tours now. <laughs> no, um, because that's just what I did my whole life, you know, until, you know, we canceled 160 shows last year, you know? So it's like, like, wow, okay, now did, what? Did you miss a lot of your 12 year old growing up then because you're out touring and you almost don't want to, you don't want to do that again with your, with your yeah, new baby? Kind of, um, you know, the 12 year old, his name is Jagger and we're really close and he grew up with that environment, you know, me yeah. leaving, coming home. So it was never a new thing for him. You know, I kind of grew up, so he's comfortable with it. Um, he's less comfortable with me coming here, you know, for like over six or seven weeks, you know, and he's not ready to come to Denmark yet. He's like, he's like, Oh, you know, I'm going to wait a little while, you know, uh, and, he, and he can't come now anyways, because of the pandemic. Sure. So, but you know, we live in the age of, a video chat like we're doing now and and he's you know on the computer doing school he's not going to school so everything for us is okay you know um i should say jagger if you're watching go to denmark man like take yeah. advantage of the fact that you have family in uh, you know one of the yes. coolest european countries so yeah. yes you oh, should I go <laughs> Right now he's, he's, you know, he's rebelling a little bit. He's like, he's like, I want to go to Dallas. Oh, <laughs> like, okay. We'll Denmark's better than Dallas. Come on. Anyway. But yeah. so, so yeah. in in, I mean, I, I always kind of feel it's like some really big names started doing zoom lessons in 2020. It was like, I kind of can't get my head around the number of people. It's like, I, it would freak me out massively to sort of just go, okay, I'm going to have a zoom lesson with one of my guitar heroes now. But yeah, it happened quite a lot, didn't it? It's just crazy. Yeah. It's really interesting because like, you know, the, the younger kids, their dads are there. Yeah. <laughs> they're on the lesson, you know, they're, they're into it. But everybody's so cool. You know what I mean? Like nobody's been overly excited or hyper or, or nutty or asking strange questions, you know? So like all the lessons have been lessons. And, and I teach in a style that is very comfortable in rock and roll uh, while tricking people into learning theory, you know, because people are so scared of the word theory and, the, and the, this mysticism of, you know, modes and things like that. So I just teach them how to do everything and don't really tell them what they're doing until the end. And I'm like, well, what you just did. And I send them a video at the end of every, of every lesson of what we learn. And then I explain to them in the video, well, this is what you're doing. This is what you learned. So, I really have fun with that. You know, I'm taking a break right now just because I need a break, <laughs> but, um, but I enjoy it. You know, I, I really, I really do. And, and people are bored, you know, <laughs> boredom. That's been the second, you know, after the actual COVID thing, that's been the second, like biggest, most damaging thing, hasn't it? To people's health. I think just, just oh, yeah. monotony well, and boredom. You know, when, when we travel to LA, my wife always comes back to Denmark before I do, you know, she'll go like two weeks or three weeks ahead of time before I go. And so when I'm at the house in LA, you know, for those three weeks, wow, I know what boredom is. It's like, it's like <laughs> whoa, okay, wait, all the kids are gone. My wife's gone. I'm giving a couple lessons a day, which doesn't take much time and you can't go anywhere. It's like, now what? You know, and I don't really watch TV. So it's like, and I don't want to play guitar eight hours a day anymore. You know what I mean? It's like, it's counterproductive for me to right. do that. You know, all of a sudden, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm playing rockabilly 24 hours a day and I forget how to play, you know, what I should be doing. And, or I start listening to Neil Young, you know, on repeat, you know, just, and I get in that mood and then I'm just like a useless human being. <laughs> so it's good to be around people. And I really feel for people that are alone, especially yeah. that been alone this whole time, you know, just getting their food and their meals and going to bed and, you know, reading the news and, and it's, it's so sad, you know, and people that, that have run out of money months ago that, that can barely survive. And, you know, I think about those people a lot, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I don't feel guilty because I, I have a more comfortable life, but I, I but I really, have compassion for those people, you know, and, and 
And I think about it a lot. And it makes me sad that we live in a time where this is happening, you know, globally. Yeah, you know. I think that it'll be a real pivotal, once it feels like life can go back to some sort of normality, it'll be a real pivotal moment, I think, for humanity to go, do we, do we kind of stick within this new routine that we've got used to? Or do we just go, boom, you know, back at the whole social, you know, interaction yeah. thing that, you know, live music and, and just social gatherings, you know, do we, do, do, we, do we live every day almost like it's our last because we've had all that taken away from us for the last, you know, year or so. And, it, and I suppose only time will tell and, and maybe each individual have, will have a different, a different perspective on how they'll be. But. I, I think human nature would say, let's party, you know, but <laughs> at the same time, I think, especially for like, let's say live gigs yeah. and things like that, that it's not going to be possible for a long mm -hmm. time, even when the coast is clear, you know, so many things have closed down, so many bands have broken up, mm -hmm. so many um, people have had to find other ways to survive that they're comfortable with now. Um, also, people working at home, I think that's going to be a big thing mm -hmm. forever now, you know, is that people are able to work at home, it saves money, and so, like you, I'm really curious yeah. to see what the reality is in general. You know, because I'll tell you something in Hollywood, um, it is zombie apocalypse. You know, you drive up yeah. all the major streets, the side streets, businesses are boarded up, graffiti, homeless everywhere, um, you know, for lease signs on every business. There's no apartments for lease, you know, it's all, you know, for sale. And so whatever recovery would ever happen there, well, I can't even imagine how long it would well, take. Well, we're, we're looking to you. The world is looking to you and your fellow musicians to somehow kickstart, you know, the life, you know, yes. how we want it to be. Um, yeah. because it's, it is easy to, I, I know that last probably two or three minutes of the, of the chat here kind of, it sort of, it was like, that's the problem, isn't it? It's like, you just get sucked into this, like, Ooh, but you've got to go, no, come on. We're going to yeah. get through this. Oh. We're going to, you know, we're going to tour like we've never toured before, write the best songs we've ever right. written. And well, we're doing that, you know, I mean, the tune, and we have done live stream shows that have been very successful. That's cool. You know, so we're, we're definitely excited about playing and finding venues to play in and, and, you know, doing this. I mean, more likely uh, than anything is that, you know, we'll, we'll be touring Europe more than the States, you know, because I think that Europe has handled it in a way that when it spikes, it just slams back down, like, hey, let's get it together. Mm. And so I think we're more likely to visit here for touring than the States. You know, the States, it's looking like, at the, you know, next fall, if we do any touring, it's more like big city flying in, doing a few shows, knocking it on the head, going back out. But all these places we would play on Tuesday, Wednesday, Monday nights in small cities, you know, that's not going to happen for a long time. And we're old. You know, Phil is, uh, <laughs> Phil just turned 64. That's and not old anymore. Come on. It's like, you know. He would agree with you. Yeah, I, 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 I'm sort of. I think that's that's the other great thing about getting older, isn't it? I'm, I'm going to be 50 next year, and I'm kind of thinking to myself, if you'd have told me that 15 years ago or 20 years ago, I'd have been gone. That's it. I'm done. Now I'm going. I'm I'm going to keep going. I've still got. You know, it's fine. I don't care anymore. It is what it is. Well, look, man. Um, you just always look at the Rolling Stones, and you know that you're young. That's, have you seen that? There's that classic meme with uh, of, of the, the Stones together and they're all wearing a mask except for Keith Richards because nothing's right. going to kill him. <laughs> it's basically... <Yeah. laughs> He's going to kill the, the virus. Absolutely. We just need some Keith Ris uh, Richards plasma injected into us all and then that's it. We'll defeat every known virus and illness there ever was. I agree with you. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, man, it's been such a pleasure and an honour to, to chat with you um, and definitely, definitely, if, you, you know, if you're in the uk with the band doing some festivals or tours or whatever come down hang with us it'd be, it'd be so cool right. you you and pete can share danish stories um yeah, Skilpels, what did he do he he means skill teller he's <laughs> mean cat 
<laughs> he's laughing in the background. I got no idea what you're talking about. We, I keep saying to Pete, we, we've got to go to Denmark. Uh, there's a cool guitar brand, another guitar brand, a little tiny one called Hanson that I want yeah. to get. So maybe if, if we get that together and, and you're over as well, we'll, we'll try and meet you for a beer or something. Baum guitar. Oh, Pete, oh, and, you know, and Baum, another, another it's, it's like, you know, hey, Denmark. Hey, I got to tell you something. Go on. I just did. I just did um, an eight-hour video shoot for their import guitars. Well, they're, yeah, com they're yeah. coming. That's, we've totally hijacked this uh, Kramer <laughs> well, video. Okay, but, with, but hey, whatever. But that's it's, Gibson approved. That was Gibson approved. It's, it's all cool, man. Look, th all good. That's, that's, you know, I love the fact that, you know, I love the fact that in the guitar world, it's like that. Although there's that, you know, that bitchiness that you talked about from the 80s and there's always going to be social media is always going to bring out that sort of, you know, vibe from a small percentage of people. But the vast majority, I'm loving the fact that, you know, guitar players, no matter what genre of music or age or anything you are, everybody just wants to be cool and talk about guitars. It's all it's all cool. That's anyway. it. Man. It's a great hobby. It is. Well, look. Have a great day. Um, you know, stay safe and everything like that. Uh, and enjoy the rest of your birthday. Do you have a cake and any idea what you're, you're going to get? I'm having a Danish birthday. I woke up to flags on the table and uh, flags in the, in the flowers. And then I'm going to have some kind of birthday rolls. Amazing. And, uh, an early dinner with my uh, in-laws and my baby and my wife. And, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a happy fellow. What, what do you buy a 55 year old rock star for his birthday then? Is it like um, some, you com know, some comfy slippers or something? What do you, a Dan <laughs> you know, a Danish. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man, look, take it easy. And that's it. I really hope we get to catch up in person at some point. Okay, right. we will for sure. Thanks a lot. And good luck with this. Kramer, everybody, yeah, go check man. it out. All right, see you soon. Yeah. Bye, man.